Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Travis. I'm the Director of Graduate Admissions here at the Shar School of Policy and Government. Uh, and thank you for joining us tonight and welcome. Um, we offer, and, and you, I'm sure you've seen this, we offer a wide variety of events, um, virtual events right now, a mix you know, during normal times where we want you all, as, you know, graduate school is a big decision and there's a lot of research involved. And one of the things we want to be able to do while you're still in the research stage is give you a sense of what, what is a graduate level discussion uh, about a crunchy topic? What's that like? What is that exchange like? Uh, how are you talking about it? Uh, how are you wrestling with some of this stuff? Um, and so we do these sample classes. And um, this is one of our classics here. Uh, I've done this one a couple of times. I learn new stuff every time, so I enjoy doing it. A um, couple of logistical things, and then we're gonna pass it over to Professor Reinert. Uh, if you are experiencing any technical issues of any kind, we, you know, just put them in the chat. Uh, I and then Paul, whose voice you heard at the beginning, we're kind of monitoring the chat line. Now, once uh, Professor Reiner gets rolling, um, if you have questions about the material, questions that you want to ask, or if Professor Reiner kind of poses a question to the audience and you'd like to chime in with an answer, please put that in the box called Q&A and not the chat box. Please put it in the Q&A box. And what Paul and I are gonna do, we're gonna keep an eye on that box and, and we're gonna relay you know, your questions and your feedback to Professor Reinert so that this can be you know, a collaborative exercise and, and that you guys can contribute as well. So without uh, further delay, it's my pleasure to introduce to you um, Program Director of our International Commerce and Policy Program and sort of the godfather of multiple graduate certificates at the Shar School, uh, Professor Ken Reiner. Thank you very much, Travis, and thank you for everyone who is here this evening. I'm going to be talking a little bit about three large subjects, globalization, development, and COVID-19, and giving you a sense of some of the things that uh, we think about in the International Commerce and Policy Program. Uh, just a couple things about who is talking to you right now. Um, Travis said I was director of the International Commerce and Policy Program. Uh, I'm a former senior international economist at the U.S. International Trade Commission. Um, I am author of a textbook that we use in the ICP program, which makes inter international economics uh, very accessible to our students. I'm an author of a book on development issues entitled No Small Hope, and also co-author of a book on the subject of this evening, globalization uh, for development. And I'd like to first begin by acknowledging that the subject of globalization is a large one, and it is a multidimensional subject. Uh, that is also true about the subject of development. One way that we describe the International Commerce and Policy Program is as a program that investigates the commercial aspects of globalization. Uh, and you can see some of the dimensions that we cover here in the program. Uh, we are very much focused on international trade. And here the distinction of trade in goods and trade in services is really critical. Uh, both of these are important. There's a tendency to focus on trade in goods, things that are tangible, but uh, the intangible services trade is uh, critical. Uh, we focus also on international production, which can be related to trade. It influences trade, but it is really um, a different realm that needs to be thought of on its own. Uh, these include activities in foreign direct investment, uh, contracting of various kinds, uh, and these appear often in what uh, are called global value chains. Uh, and the last of these global value chains is an area in which there is a lot of research and policy interest right now. Uh, we focus on international finance and capital flows. Uh, and these uh, include 
uh, such things. Well, let me back up there for a little bit. International finance capital flows involve the international exchange of assets. And these assets can be bonds, equities, and also an area of activity known as commercial bank lending. Uh, I'm going to give you just a hint of some of international finance here. Uh, transactions in international trade show up in the current account of the balance of payments. Transactions and capital flows show up in the capital financial account. So these aspects of economic globalization relate to the balance of payments. Uh, we in the ICP program and also the Shar School more, gen more generally are very much concerned with migration. And we tend to break out low skilled migration from high skilled migration uh, because there are different dynamics and different policy regimes for these two areas. Uh, we do not leave out globalization in the form of ideas and culture. Uh, this relates to uh, international transmission of technologies, uh, as well as uh, international transmission of ideas about policy and what might good policy be, okay? So globalization, a rather large realm. Development, also rather a large realm. Uh, I am an international economist, and from an economic standpoint, we can state that the primary goal of economic globalization, excuse me, of global economic development is the improvement of human well-being. And there we feel like we're in our uh, safe zone, but it turns out that it's rather difficult to identify or isolate a universal conception of human well-being. And for our purposes this evening, uh, to uh, keep things a little simple, we can think about three broad views with regard to the improvement of human well-being. One is the growth view focused on the growth in GDP or gross national income per capita. An alternative dominant view is one of development as capabilities expansion or the notion of human development. And something that I emphasize a great deal uh, is a third view on basic goods provision. And we'll say a few words about that uh, as well. Uh, well-being as growth emphasizes the sustained increase in either gross domestic product per capita or gross national income per capita. And here, Poverty is seen as a deprivation of income. Well-being conceptualized as human development emphasizes what individuals can achieve or their capabilities. And here, poverty is seen differently. It is not a deficit of income. It is deprivations of capabilities of various kinds. These are primarily focused on education and health but others matter as well. Uh, in my own focus on well-being as basic goods provision, there's an emphasis on the provision of basic goods and basic services that meet basic needs. And poverty here is seen as a deprivation of basic goods and services. And we emphasize that the provision of basic goods and services can both support growth and support capabilities expansion, okay? Now for the moment, let's just work in the growth paradigm. Uh, and this is the dominant paradigm in international economics and economic development, a focus on growth. And uh, from a theoretical perspective, we tend to focus on gross domestic product but from a poverty perspective, we focus on gross national income. Just you know, for your information, the difference here, the gap that proves to be important for some countries is a concept known as net factor income. We're not gonna go into this uh, in the short period of time we have here this evening, but net factor income is also a component of the balance of payments. So something that is related to international macroeconomics, international finance, the balance of payments, 
matters for how we measure and think about development. Growth became an important favored development indicator after World War II. It was in a sense baked into the institutions of both the World Bank and the IMF, uh, which you know, got their start you know, somewhere in the early 1950s. And at the same time, uh, an MIT economist by the name of Robert Solo introduced a very important model of growth known as the Solo model. This is something he published in 1956. And all of these things came together institutionally and theoretically for a focus on growth in development policy that is with us <clears throat> to this day. Uh, I just to illustrate things a little bit for you. Here is a uh, chart uh, for uh, GDP per capita in three countries. This is real GDP per capita or inflation-adjusted GDP ca per capita, and the three countries are Ghana, South Korea, and Vietnam. And you'll see here in the period of time covered that. Uh, we have Korea, the high red line that is increasing rapidly over time. Uh, Ghana and Vietnam, um, you know, way down at the bottom of this graph. Uh, Ghana initially above Vietnam, Vietnam is now a tad above Ghana. And so uh, from a growth perspective, economists ask the question, how can we make countries more like South Korea? And indeed, East Asia is held up as a model for development and development policy. Okay, this is the growth perspective. But the human development or capabilities perspective would question this and want to think more about some other indicators. And a very important one is life expectancy. And I want you, you to keep an eye as we move to the next slide on Vietnam. Uh, the orange line here. And you'll see when we look at life expectancy, Vietnam is much more like South Korea than Ghana. Uh, and that is to say that there's something about Vietnam that gives it a higher life expectancy, even in the aftermath of the Vietnamese War, um, that uh, distinguishes it from uh, Ghana and makes it more like South Korea. And so this difference in perspective can matter a great deal for how we think about development. Uh, so from the previous slide, Ghana might think more about, well, how can we be like South Korea? But from the second slide, the question that is relevant might be, how can Ghana, from the point of view of health and life expectancy, be more like Vietnam? Okay, and these different comparisons uh, matter a great deal. There are a number of important limitations to the growth perspective, the GDP per capita perspective that we always need to keep in mind because it is so dominant. Per capita GDP only includes market activities. Any activities that take place outside of the market such as a farming family feeding itself with its produce, uh, that is not part of GDP and therefore not part of GDP per capita. As we saw in the previous slides, GDP per capita may not always accurately reflect human development. Also, GDP per capita is an average measure and there is nothing that it captures with regard to the distribution of income among households. Uh, the distribution, which by the way, and we'll mention this, uh, will be worsening uh, after COVID-19. And also the nominal or currency exchange rates, okay? And exchange rates are something very important at the heart of the ICP program. The nominal or currency exchange rates used to convert GDP into US dollars in order to compare among countries can be misleading because cost of living, in particular with regard to non-traded services, can differ substantially across countries. 
And there's an adjustment we make uh, that we talk about in our development classes uh, to account for that. Overall, per capita GDP does not measure welfare or well-being, okay? It does not capture either of those things. This is something that we need to keep in mind. Okay. Hey, Ken, uh, before we go further, well, there's actually yes. a question that came in on uh, sure, the, the previous chart. Um, the person asked, can you repeat, please? Can you explain the chart? Is this for inflation or overinflation? Um, this chart here with regard to real GDP or? Um, it's, I'm not clear from the, from the chat box. Um, okay. Rosalind, Jump in who, if you're here. Okay. She just, uh, typed in yes. So I guess that we're on this chart then. All right. What this, um, does is it represents GDP per capita adjusted for inflation. And so this is known as real GDP per capita. If you look on the vertical axis, the units are in 2010 US dollars. And when you see something like that, this indicates that we're dealing in real terms. 2010 US dollars have been used across this whole series. Uh, if it were nominal GDP per capita, you would see something like just US dollars or current US dollars. So this has been adjusted for inflation in each of these three countries. Great, thank you for that clarification. Oh, thank you for the question. Uh, we do engage in some economics in the ICP program. Uh, we do not do this with regard to uh, calculus. Uh, we do this largely with basic algebra and graphs. And I want to just do a tad of this with regard to growth theory. The solo growth theory that I mentioned is now known as old growth theory or the solo model. There's a new growth theory that's called either new or endogenous growth theory and the latter accounts for the effects of human capital, trade, and institutions, uh, and a number of other things, um, rather than just uh, capital deepening, which we'll mention in a moment. The research, both theoretical and empirical, with regard to growth is vast, uh, and we try to summarize it in our uh, classes in the ICP program. I mentioned that we use some algebra. So I've given you one equation here, the intensive production function. The left-hand side, as you remember from your algebra class, is the dependent variable. And here we have GDP per capita, a lowercase y that is representing GDP per capita and in the intensive production function. On the right-hand side, we have an independent variable, a lowercase k which is the capital labor ratio uh, or the ratio of physical capital to workers. Uh, and we have the F there for function. And then there's also this other term, the A, which is sometimes referred to as a technology factor, but it can account for things other than technology. And so I'm gonna to refer to this here as a shift factor. And so we have an algebraic equation, independent variable on the right-hand side, uh, the capital labor ratio, dependent variable on the left-hand side. And in the ICP program, we engage in graphical analysis. This is a graph of the intensive production function. On the horizontal axis, we have our dependent variable, the capital labor ratio. On the vertical, excuse me, the independent variable, the capital labor ratio. On the vertical axis is our dependent variable, GDP per capita, something that we're interested in. And we have a graphical relationship between these two. The graph is an increasing graph. Its slope is positive. So as the capital labor ratio increases, GDP per capita increases. This is a phenomenon that economists call capital deepening 
but something you'll also read about in the financial press. This graph is positive, but it's decreasingly positive. Its slope becomes flatter as we move out from the origin. This reflects what we call diminishing returns to physical capital and labor. And this process of the capital labor ratio increasing and this causing growth is a fundamental concept in economics referred to as capital deepening. But there are also shift factors that shift the entire relationship between the capital labor ratio and GDP per capita. And in economics, we spend a lot of time talking about differences in movements along the curve. Let me just move back. Capital deepening is a movement along the curve and shifts of the curve. These changes that could occur through that A factor shift the intensive production function. And empirically, we know that shifts that come about through that A factor are at least as relevant as movements along or capital deepening, okay? So this is the kind of graphical analysis we use in the ICP program. We mentioned the distinction between old growth theory or the solo model or new growth theory. Uh, and the new growth theory allows us to think about different factors along with labor and human capital, we begin to think about human capital. This is to say, you are not just your physical abilities as a laborer, you bring knowledge, skills, talent, which are all part of your human capital. And um, intuitively, we would think that there'd be a positive relationship between human capital and growth. And new growth theory uh, addresses this. It also, in some of its variants, looks uh, particularly at research and development processes, how they come about, and how this might feed into the fa factor A. Why is this called endogenous growth theory? It's because it endogenizes or explains that shift factor A, okay? I'm skipping over a huge research agenda here, but um, in the time we have this evening, what if we were to identify some of the important factors for growth? the answer to the question, what matters for growth? Um, through a lot of research that went back and forth over a couple decades, we can now say that human capital matters for growth. It matters in its education form, and this is where most research has taken place. It also matters in its health form, that healthier workers are more productive workers. Institutions, as it turns out, also matter a great deal. And in here, we look at the rule of law, property rights, contract enforcement, regulatory systems, and social insurance. There's a tendency, kind of a stereotype of economists, to think that they're very bare bones, free market libertarian. But in actuality, there's a lot of focus on how particular regulatory systems might support growth, how particular social insurance systems might support growth, particularly when we have a significant amount of globalization as in the era in which we are living today. And these uh, regulatory systems and social insurance can help us address the sort of impacts of globalization on societies. As it turns out, and this is where the ICP program can be important, openness, economic openness or economic globalization matters for growth. And this can show up in terms of trade, foreign direct investment, global value chains, and ideas or ideas about technology, research and development, uh, more open economies tend to grow faster 
than closed economies. Okay, again, general tendency here from the empirical literature. Okay, let me just pause there for a second, having talked a little bit about growth. Any burning questions up to here? Anything showing up, Travis? Uh, not at the moment, but uh, right. as Professor as Professor Reinert just said, uh, if you've got uh, if you'd like to ask any questions uh, about the material that we've covered so far, or if this has sparked a question about what might be coming down the pike in our time tonight, you know, feel free to ask ahead of time. We we do want to make this a little bit interactive if we can. I'm going to just. All right. You're on a roll. Slowly uh, move on, but please interrupt me if you would like by putting something in the Q&A. There has been a lot of focus since COVID-19 hit on poverty. And from the World Bank, we have three uh, measurements of poverty. Those living below $5.50 a day those living below $3.10 a day, and those living below $1.90 per day. Uh, and the latter are known as the extremely poor, okay? Um, I'm gonna show you some charts in a second, but just keep in mind that the COVID-19 pandemic has significantly worsened these trends, and we'll get to that in a moment. These are the data we have from the World Bank on poverty in those three measures. And uh, 2015 is the last year uh, for which we have data. Um, I am surprised that 2018 has not shown up, but uh, as of a couple of weeks ago when I extracted these data, it still was not there. Uh, the headline emphasized by the World Bank up to uh, COVID-19 were the green bars a significant decline in extreme poverty. Most of this, as it turns out, taking place uh, in uh, the PRC uh, in China. Uh, the blue bars, a uh, slightly less dramatic decline in poverty, uh, and the red bars, an expansion, expanded concept of poverty at $5.50 a day, uh, a lot less movement. We can break this out by region, uh, and you'll see, if you look at these blue bars here, this is East Asia and Pacific, a substantial decline in poverty taking place in uh, China. Uh, you can see uh, South Asia, the purple bars, a less dramatic but significant decline in extreme poverty. Uh, where extreme poverty has increased is Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and that is a cause uh, of concern. Um, we're going to get back to poverty shortly when we talk about the impacts of COVID-19. I do want to uh, say a few words about basic goods and services. There's an old tradition in development policy focused on basic needs. The basic goods approach uh, embraces that, but uh, focuses on actual uh, goods and services, particular goods and services that meet uh, basic human needs. Uh, I've given you a sample of this uh, in this table. Uh, nutritious food, clean water, sanitation, health services, education services, housing, electricity, and human security services. And one way to think about these uh, as, is as just basic goods and services that are important. Another is that these are sub-communities in the development policy world. Uh, people who work on water and development, or education and development, or energy and development, okay? Uh, and we get a hint of this in a couple of different courses in the ICP program. One that I teach on uh, development and another on development project analysis. As it turns out, and I'm not gonna go through this 
uh, in detail here. Uh, but as it turns out, deprivations in these basic goods and services are quite large. Uh, and you can look down this chart uh, and see that we have uh, 800 million people suffering from chronic hunger, 800 million people lacking access to improved drinking water sources, over 2 billion people without access to clean and safe toilets, and on down the list. These are concerns because these matter for human capital in its health component, in its education component, and therefore uh, for growth and development more broadly. Uh, let's say a few words about COVID-19 and its impacts. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that uh, one book I've authored is entitled No Small Hope towards the universal provision of basic goods and services. Uh, this was published in 2018, and somewhere uh, around February 2019, as COVID was um, beginning to take off, I scrolled back through the health chapter in my book and stumbled across a sentence. Uh, the global health system has some ways to go before we can be confident of its readiness to protect vulnerable people from the inevitable incipient pandemics of the future. Okay. Uh, I'm not a health economist, I'm not an epidemiologist. This is just um, basic knowledge in the health and development field. Uh, in April, end of April, on a New York Times article, uh, reflecting on the sustainable development goals that we'll mention if we have time, uh, there was a statement that a resolution that committed the United Nations to eliminating poverty and hunger and providing access to education for all by 2020 may now be a pipe dream. And indeed, it is a pipe dream uh, in the face of COVID-19. Okay. Just a few headline impacts with regard to economic globalization. Uh, the IMF has estimated that global trade in 2010 will fall by approximately 10%. The World Bank has estimated in the migration realm that the remittances of migrants back to their home countries will fall by approximately um, 20% in 2020. And these remittance flows are hugely important for uh, poverty alleviation in the countries of origin of migrants. The United Nations Conference on Trade and Development uh, in Geneva estimates that foreign direct investment in 2020 will fall by approximately 30%. So we're gonna have a retrenchment in economic globalization in 2020, 2021. And these seem like relatively small percentages perhaps, but these are series of data that have been increasing significantly for decades, and they will begin uh, periods of downturns. Uh, there's a group at the World Bank, which I've done a tiny bit of work with in the past, called the Global Prospects Group. Uh, and in their most recent uh, Global Prospects publication, uh, they do a lot of uh, macroeconomic forecasting. I'm just pulling out three sentences for you here. Our baseline forecast envisions the deepest global recession since World War II. The pandemic will have severe and long-lasting socioeconomic impacts that may well weaken long-term growth prospects. Okay? Long-term, not short-term. The plunge in investment, the erosion of human capital, and the rupture of trade and supply linkages are reasons for uh, these impacts. And then interestingly for the World Bank, which tends to be very uh, sort of rah-rah about globalization and poverty alleviation, there's this statement, even before the pandemic, development for people in the world's poorest countries was slow 
to raise their incomes, enhance living standards, or narrow inequality. Uh, these, this is one small piece of their forecast uh, to focus on GDP, something we've talked about, gross domestic product. Um, and they are comparing uh, the current recession in a red line, the uh, global financial crisis in 2009 with the blue line, and three previous recessions uh, with the uh, gray uh, area. And you can see that uh, the 2020 recession um, is more severe than all of these previous uh, recessions. So we're in something uh, quite significant right now, historically. Uh, a once in a century pandemic uh, and a uh, very steep decline in global output. What will the impacts of this recession be? Estimates from the World Bank are that extreme poverty, this is what we looked at previously in the presentation, will increase by 100 million individuals. The more expansive definitions of poverty um, give us increases ranging up to half a billion individuals. Estimates from the FAO, Food and Agricultural Organization, are the number of individuals suffering from acute hunger will double. Uh, significant growth appears to be a long way off. And um, in a number of uh, venues, I have argued that given this collapse of growth prospects, that we need to focus on basic goods and services, the provision of basic goods and services in the form of what I call basic development goals, okay? If you are sort of reading the financial press or in reading about development policy, you will remember that there were some previous Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs, uh, and that these had eight goals and 60 targets. Our current sustainable development goals have 17 such goals and 169 targets. Uh, and I and others have argued that the sustainable development goals are not helpful. Uh, if you start reading through the 17 goals and the 169 targets, um, well, let me just state this in the first person. My conclusion is, is that there are way too many uh, to guide policy. They are too broad in scope and even some individual targets are too broad. Such things as improve institutions everywhere. Uh, too many, too broad, and too vague is the conclusion that I and others have reached with regard to the sustainable development goals. Uh, and uh, in 2018, I was presenting at the public forum at the World Trade Organization, and there was another uh, panel on the sustainable development goals. And there was someone on the panel that was involved with devising these. And he said, we need to keep in mind that these were political. They were a political agreement at that time. Uh, and the point I would make is that political agreement may not be helping us right now. But nonetheless, every UN agency uh, is having to guide their activities in terms of the SDGs. I've seen an article from librarians, how they're gonna embrace the SDGs. Uh, our university, new university president, Greg Washington is talking about the SDGs. But my suggestion is we focus on a much restricted list, seven goals and 10 targets. I'm not gonna go through these in any detail, but these are rewordings of the sustainable development goals, pulling out which is what is most essential, particularly 
in the aftermath of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we need to focus our attention on a restricted set of goals, given that we're going to have very little growth, uh, potentially in the long term. <clears throat> and this past summer, uh, an article that I wrote outlining these was published in uh, a journal known as Ethics and International Affairs. Okay. Uh, let me pause there. Um, Travis, has anything else shown up on the Q&A? Do people want to jump in here before I say a few words about the ICP program? Uh, looks like the chat box is clear. Okay. Um, but we can we can hit the pause button for sort of a half a minute and give folks a chance to type in because we did cover a lot of ground there and we have uh, yes there's a there's there's a lot of ominous you know news and outlooks <laughs> towards the yes. end there yeah that uh, well i'm just i'm conveying uh information here that's other people have uh worked on you know with some diligence yeah no i i'm yeah, yeah. I guess um, I'll throw in a question before you pivot over a little bit, if if there are none other, you know, looking, you know, what I know of the program and of the students and, and of um, the, you know, the, the forecasts and outlooks that you, that you shared towards the end there, you know, our, our degree programs in international commerce and policy is, is no exception. Really like to meld uh, theory and practice. Yes. Um, you know, we are not people who just sit back and, you know, abstractly admire problems, we, we seek to find, you know, solutions or ways to mitigate them at least. So for, you know, I would say for early professionals who are interested in development work, I go to a lot of events and, and many conversations I have with folks begin with, I want to work in development. Mm -hmm. So if you are thinking of working in development or you're in development already and, and you're thinking about taking on a larger role, as, as you look at what we're what's unfolding now and what we're likely facing in both the near future and, and down the line. Um, for folks who are interested in this and in, in serving and helping populations, what's, um, what's some of the first work, you know, roll up your sleeves and get to work, work that you think um, professionals in this area can do that has the biggest impact? Um, I do think that, um, you know, we're, we're talking about graduate degrees here. I do think it's important along the process to um, get a master's degree, ICP program, or another uh, program in the Star School or elsewhere. That's critical. But any entry point at this stage, I think, can be um, valid. Uh, you know, we need people working on sanitation systems. Uh, we need people working in education. Uh, we need people who are mainline economists, such as myself, um, you know, trying to work out uh, what supports growth, what supports uh, development, what is an appropriate trade policy, what should our posture be to capital flows. Uh, any of these entry points are valid. Um, and we're not just talking about the, the government sector here or even just the NGO sector. Uh, private sector is important. Um, the ICP program is always bridged public and private. Uh, and we have a significant number of ICP students and alums working in the private sector as well. We have students moving among the private sector, the public sector, NGOs. They're not static in terms of their careers. Uh, so all of these entry points uh, can be a valid way of engaging uh, in this uh, material. Does something show up in Q&A here? Yeah, um, do you see it? I mean, I can read it off to you if you don't see it. Let's see if I can pull this up here. Um, I may be jumping ahead, but how ready can we be as a public as public researchers and scholars for globalization after tragedy. <laughs> How can we overcome misinformation, uncertainty, and confusion in the world? Um, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that, uh, that question. Uh, 
in previous years, a question I often got in admission sessions was, is the ICP program pro-globalization or anti-globalization? And my answer was, it's neither. We are pro-analysis. Uh, we engage in the analysis of economic globalization and its development impacts. Uh, and I think um, analysis still matters. Policy regimes matter now more than ever before. Uh, and getting things right is more important than it was before. Uh, and engaging in these discussions um, is, is really quite, um, quite important. Um, so we are going to go through a period of, of some tragedy here, obviously, uh, but there's also um, new things <laughs> happening. Um, there was a article in last week's Economist magazine looking at uh, the formation of new enterprises in the United States. It's increasing dramatically right now in the middle of a recession. Uh, we are in a structural shift, going to bring us in new, uh, in, to new directions, uh, but we need to get through this and we need to keep analyzing our way through this. I think we'll get another question in the right. Q&A box about- SDGs. Um, yeah. um, are they a collection of worldwide goals? Absolutely. Um, and with the issue of climate change, um, how can it influence the sustainable development goals? Um, climate change is baked into the sustainable development goals. That doesn't necessarily show up in the basic development goals I outlined, but they are implicit in them in a number of different ways. First, um, this whole focus on basic goods and services that I've been pushing, there are two communities this is so interesting to me that are interested in it. One of them are climate scientists because they want to understand what sustainable levels of consumption are. What is the amount of consumption we need to meet basic needs around the world? And you know, what would that look like from a climate standpoint? And that's one community that's engaged with this. Um, and then interestingly, um, the religious ethics community uh, and in both its Christian and other variants have been very interested in what uh, this all means for the common good uh, and what this means for sustainable lifestyles uh, and uh, for, for you know, some semblance of, of justice. Um, the other thing I would mention is in development policy, there is something that's called the WEF sector, W-E-F, water, energy, food. And there's a community focused on the sustainability issues that exist among water and providing clean water, energy, alternative energy, and food, food security, and you know how those three things work together. How can developed economies facilitate or assist in the basic um, development goals? Um, I think that uh, setting a tone for international cooperation, something that's not popular right now, um, is important. Um, Retreating into nationalistic regimes is probably not going to be helpful right now. Uh, and we need to have still open trading system, particularly in medical goods, particularly in food, so that we can ensure health security, uh, food security. Uh, foreign aid of particular types is going to be very important. We are going to have some very significant food crises as a result of COVID 
uh, 19 and the global funds that uh, will be necessary to uh, deliver the food aid will be really critical. This is not a time to retreat into our separate nations. Uh, we still need to be uh, looking uh, out into the world. That's not to say we're not going to have reconfiguration of global value chains and the like, uh, but we still need some semblance of open uh, international regimes. And, you know, high income countries have a role uh, in that, in sort of setting uh, the tone for this. Uh, please let me know if I have not answered any question uh, sufficiently. Um, the ICP program comes at these issues from an interdisciplinary standpoint. We don't just have economists teaching in it. It's an accessible program. You can be an engineering major or a French major and be in this program and succeed. It's oriented towards practitioners. Uh, I, you see at the beginning of the presentation, I have a background in the US government, the US International Trade Commission. Maurice Kugler, another uh, professor here, uh, was head of research at um, the, um, uh, in New York uh, at uh, the Human Development Report. He's worked at the World Bank. I consulted with the World Bank, JP Singh, uh, does extensive consulting uh, with the United Nations. We have a uh, practitioner point of view in the program. Uh, my slides seem to have frozen. There we go. Um, we get at this through a series of courses, and we've thought this through quite carefully. We have a gateway class in global political economy. We have a class, we call it TCC in technology, culture, and commerce. This is taught by JP Singh, who is an expert on technolo technological issues in the WTO, but is also an expert in culture. He actually founded uh, a master's program in culture at, in Edinburgh. Uh, we have two economics classes, microeconomics, its applications in trade policy, macroeconomics, and macroeconomic policy. We have a methods class, data analysis and global political economy. This class taught by JP Singh and an adjunct from the US International Trade Commission has near perfect course evaluations in a methods class. Uh, this is a very successful class, so successful that it's going to start to be used by our international security uh, master's program. Uh, we have a class on global trade relations that teaches you international trade law, a class on global financial crises uh, as well. These are some of the ways we get into this subject. We have three optional concentrations that you can choose by uh, selecting your electives in these areas. And this is where uh, you operate with our ICP advisor, Paul Nooney. Um, one in global finance, investment, and trade, another in global development and governance, and a third in global risk and strategy. Global risk and strategy links the ICP program to our international security program and our very prominent biodefense master's program. And then if you're interested in graduate education, but you're not quite ready to go for a full master's degrees, we have two certificates related to the ICP program. One in strategic trade, uh, looking at the national security and international security aspects of trade, uh, and another in illicit trade analysis. Uh, and these are ways of getting a certificate um, without doing a master's degree, but they can also be added on to the end of your ICP degree. Questions on this? Anyone, uh, please do chime in uh, in Q&A. Uh, and 
the last slide, you will see my email here. Um, and you should feel free to email me at any time. Uh, and you know that could be tomorrow or six months from now, whenever you feel the need to have something clarified. Uh, I am interacting with uh, prospective students on email all the time and it's something, well, pre-COVID, I did this often in person, but now a lot of it's on uh, email and over the phone. Uh, and it's something I'm very happy to do. Uh, questions on the material this evening, the ICP program, other aspects of the Shar School, what can we help you with? Mr. Chairman, real quick, we're certainly happy to field questions about the school and this program, ICP and other programs. I'm going to put a link in the chat real quick. This is a link to our upcoming events to include, we have an open house next Thursday. So Thursday of next week, we'll have an online open house uh, where we will have a general presentation about the school. And then we're gonna break off into individual program specific breakout sessions. So there will be a whole session devoted to really unpacking the ICP curriculum, talking about what the students are doing, some of the alums are doing. Um, so if you've, attended this and, and you're looking pretty closely at one of our programs, whether it's spring or fall, or you're just beginning that, that graduate school research and you're just kind of trying to survey the options that are out there and kick the tires a little bit, definitely would encourage you to attend our open house um, next Thursday night. Um, we'd love to have you there. Other thing I'll mention is that the admission staff makes the admissions process easy. Uh, the student services staff uh, make being a Shar School student easy. Uh, these are individuals who work very hard and are very good at what they do. Uh, and my interactions and students' interactions with them are, are really quite uh, positive. Um, you know, they, they are here to help you and they, they do a very good job of that. Uh, so you can be confident that there are people here um, that can help you. And we work together quite seamlessly. If one person can't help you, then they will uh, get you in contact with someone uh, who can. Okay. Uh, what I would add to that is uh, there's another group of folks who really pitch in, which is our alumni. And then yes. ICP alumni are, are particularly eager and active. Uh, I'm not trying to keep folks online forever, but um, Ken, would you mind just talking a little bit about the community of folks who have completed this degree and, and yeah. how they're, you know, working with our current students and in the school? Uh, the Shar School has an alumni association. The ICP students are some of the most active individuals in the Shar School Alumni Association and as well the University Alumni Association. Um, and Shar School alumni are, uh, are very good at coming back and helping. And this includes ICP alums. Uh, they help people do mock interviews. Uh, they help people uh, network. Uh, they're very active on LinkedIn. Uh, they're active in uh, organizing events. Uh, and so you become part of this community uh, that carries over into uh, your career. Uh, and in fact, you can be five years out uh, and contact our career services staff uh, and they will help you and they will get you in contact with other uh, ICP alum who are also there to help you. Uh, and we, as I mentioned earlier, we cover the private sector, the government sector, uh, international organizations, NGOs. Uh, so it's really quite a crowd uh, consisting of thousands of individuals because the program has been in existence since approximately 1990. So it's a fantastic community. <laughs> We have hit the 7.30 mark, we're right on time. This is when we were intending to end, but 
Um, if there's a last minute question, please do feel free to quickly type into Q and A. Um, and remember that we are always here uh, for you. Uh, and you should, you know, contact us at any time. No, definitely. And I, I'm going to put one more um, thing in the chat line, which is the email address for the, and then we can wrap up. Shar at gmu.edu. Yep, that is the email address for the graduate and uh, graduate admissions office. Me and my team. We have our individual email addresses, but that's the address just specifically for graduate admissions. And my team and I, we are in that email address all day long, in addition to our own email address. And what I would like to encourage everyone to do um, when we have events, always encourage folks, if you have an admissions question, great, please, by all means, send it to us. But if you have a question or something you wanna learn more about and it's not exactly in the admissions lane or it's not even remotely in the admissions lane, but you're not sure who to ask or you're not sure where to get started researching that, please let us know, please email us. Um, one of the things we love to do is, is connect folks to the information, the resources, the people, the centers, the students, the alumni, whoever, the, that they want to um, speak with and get information from so that you can make an informed choice on graduates. Well, we're really happy with what, we're, what we do. We're, we're proud of, of our degree programs and of our community and the way that folks stay engaged. So we're happy to share. We're eager to share. So whatever your question is, whatever you want to learn more about, even if it's not admissions, please email me and my team. Uh, we'll get you connected real fast to the information you need. Yeah. The Star School is a fantastic place. We hope you join us in one of our, our programs. Thanks for coming out, everybody, tonight. All right. Thank you all.